Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. Pearl S. Buck is an author that I might not have read had it not been for that Nobel Prize project that I have told you about like a million times before. I cannot say that I was interested in her, so what I did back then when I was reading the Nobel Prize winners was I went to Half Price Books and I just grabbed the first book by her that I could find and that happened to be Portrait of a Marriage. This is not a major piece in her body of work. It is also set in the US, so as you may know, Pearl Buck is known primarily for her novels of life in China. So I kept telling myself, Jorge, you need to read something that's more representative of her work. Many years later, I read East Wind, West Wind. That did the trick. That was her first novel, and I really, really liked it. But I kept telling myself, there's that masterpiece, right? That book that so many people have read by Pearl Buck, a classic, The Good Earth. That is the one that I have read just now, and here I am doing the usual thing just about to share with you some ideas on this great novel. Let me give you some quick info about the author and also about the novel. Pearl Buck is a US author, but she spent many years, actually 40 years of her life, living in China, and she left the US for China when she was only four months old. So she actually felt like an outsider in the US. The first time that she visited the US, she felt like she did not belong there or that she did not understand her own country. She was extremely, and I do mean extremely prolific, she has so many books, but it was The Good Earth that actually made her famous. It won the Pulitzer Prize when it was published in the year 1931, that was the publication date, and this novel was also instrumental in getting Pearl Buck the Nobel Prize for literature. Since I mentioned that, let me share with you the citation. So, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Pearl Buck, quote, for her rich and truly epic descriptions of peasant life in China and for her biographical masterpieces. Very interesting that those biographical masterpieces are mentioned. Those are a biography of her mother and the biography of her father. So, very interesting that the Nobel Committee chose to mention that. But primarily she is known for her Chinese novels. So what is The Good Earth? The Good Earth is a novel and it basically presents the story of Wang Lung from his origins as a very humble farmer to a very wealthy landowner. And when we meet him at the beginning of the novel, he is living with his father six years after his mother has died and it is the day that he is about to get married. He is going to marry Olan, who is a slave girl who works at the house of Wang. In the course of the novel, we see him facing lots of problems from natural ones, for example, a severe drought, to catastrophes such as a famine that affects the entire population, and also personal problems. For example, he has a lot of trouble dealing with his family, especially with his uncle and the fam family of that uncle. So this is a great story, okay? It's a story of rags to riches and all the problems that come with that. Women have a very prominent role in The Good Earth and in the character of Olan we actually have a very well-developed female character, but this is primarily the story of Wang Lung. Let me tell you a little bit what he is like. I would say that he is humble and proud. Okay, so he does not put on airs because of his origins, but he is also proud of his work because he is also very hardworking. Another important trait that he has, he is thrifty. And it is really this quality when you pair it with the hard work that he does that allows him to go from being very humble to being very wealthy in the novel. He is far from perfect. Okay, especially when you consider his very complex relationship with his wife, Olan. But at the end of the day, he is a likable character, and we care about him as we read the novel. The style of the novel is very beautiful, and it has something of the myth and of the legend to it. Also, as I read, I kept thinking that maybe there was a type of a biblical style to it, and that is really hardly surprising when you consider that Pearl Buck was actually the daughter of missionaries. That is one of the reasons why she lived in China. The Good Earth, uh, because of this wonderful style that it has 
is actually a page turner. I was surprised by that, especially in the second half, when you come to the second half of the novel, because Pro Buck really knows how to combine action, description, and dialogue very well. She is a master stylist. The pace of the novel is really quite fast. And another ability that I found in, in this writing, specifically in the writing of Pearl Buck, is that she knows exactly at what moments to pause and then at what moments to push the narrative forward. That is a very rare ability, even in the best writers and the best storytellers. So I think that is commendable and I thought I would mention that. I have given you a little bit of a general info on the novel. Let me share with you now some themes, okay? I always like to look at important themes. The first one that I want to highlight is the theme of the dignity of work. And one thing you see in this novel is the idea that idleness can only lead to problems, okay? This happens to Wang Lung and it happens to one of his sons also. They experience the negative effects of idleness. For example, Wang Lung, the moment that he becomes idle, that he stops working, he begins to disparage his wife. His wife is very hardworking, but he begins to treat her poorly because of that. And then his son, also, because he is not working, he becomes melancholy. So, at the risk of stating the obvious, the good earth is really about the redeeming power of the land, because work is really tied directly to the land in this case. The characters, because they are farmers, they actually see the product of their hard work. And part of the message here is that when we are busy, we don't really have a lot of time to become melancholy, right? It's like working keeps you healthy. That's the first thing that I want to highlight. The second one is the idea that money and power corrupt, okay? When Wang Lung becomes prosperous, he stops working and he goes to a tea house. And at this tea house, he meets a woman by the name of Cuckoo, and through her, he meets a woman called Lotus. This is when most of his troubles begin because he actually develops an obsession. It's really lust, okay, which is a theme that you can see throughout this novel. And this leads him to all sorts of poor decisions, and he begins to waste his fortune also, because he wants this woman, Lotus, and then he wants to keep her by his side, so he has to spend even more money. In other words, wealth leads him to problems that he did not even have before he became wealthy. Something that you can see in this novel is the concept that Poverty comes with a lot of problems, but wealth also comes with a lot of problems. So it's really up to you to decide, you know, which set of problems you prefer. And lust, by the way, is a concept or a problem that you see throughout the novel. It's really a driving force behind the reasons why the characters act the way they do. You see it in the men, especially, as a kind of a destructive type of inheritance. It's something that is passed from generation to generation almost, you could say, as a type of original sin. Third important theme that I would like to share with you, that is the rural versus the urban space. This is a novel that is very conscious of that. At one point, Wang Lung has to leave the land. He sees himself forced to do that, and he leaves his land with his family, and they move to the city where they become beggars. This is a very heartbreaking part of the novel. And when he gets there, he notices that the city people laugh at him because he is uncouth, because he is illiterate. But he sees himself as somebody who is simple, but who is honest, somebody who is hardworking also. The people who are laughing at him, they may think that he is a fool, but they are not landowners. He knows that he is a landowner and he values the land. The land is his life, really. So many of the city people, even though they laugh at him, they do not have that advantage of the connection between the work they do and the land. They are disconnected from the land. And that is something that he realizes, but they do not. And the final theme that I want to place emphasis on is the concept of the gender and the age gaps between the characters. Pearl Buck is great at portraying the differences between men and women, especially in Chinese society, because she knew it very well. Both Wang Lung and Olan are disappointed, for example, when they have a daughter, because they know that in this society, the future of that daughter is not going to be a very positive one. 
Buck does not really idealize things. Okay, you can see it in this example that I have just given you when they have the daughter. But also, you can also see that Olan is clearly subservient. Okay, so socially, she is subservient to her husband. But at the same time, she is portrayed as hardworking and also a very strong woman, a very thrifty person. She gives birth by herself, for example. In all the cases, I lost count of how many kids she has in the novel. But every time she takes care of the whole thing, the whole process, right? Wang Long is like, I don't know anything about this, I don't understand anything. Olan takes care of everything. Buck is also great. That has to do with the gender, right? But she's also great at portraying the generation gap. You can see it in the relationship between Wang Lung and his sons, specifically. And in the moments, for example, when it comes to make the decision whether these sons are going to be educated or not, it seems that education changes the attitude of these characters, the sons, towards the land. That is something to look out for. But you can also see the generation gap when you compare Wang Lung to his father. Okay, there are key moments in the novel where his father offers his, his perspective and you can see a big difference right there. So those were some themes. Let me share with you some ideas now on the film adaptation which I have just seen. It was released in 1937, directed by Sidney Franklin. And I don't really have much to say about the movie other than that it is a very good, faithful adaptation of the novel with a few omissions. There are some scenes, some important passages from the novel that were not put in the movie because the movie is long enough at 2 hours and 15 or 20 minutes or something like that. Now, the movie was actually based on a stage adaptation of The Good Earth. So the novel was adapted to the stage and then the film is based primarily on that. So that's where you can see probably some of the omissions. Something that has to be said when we talk about The Good Earth, the movie, is that it is usually cited, unfortunately, as an example of whitewashing. What I think about that is that when you consider the time period when it was released, once again we're talking about 1937, that is not really surprising. Some people, for example, said that the character of Olan should have been played by Anna May Wong. That would have been fantastic, but back in those days, you even had rules saying that if the lead actor was white, the lead actress had to be white also. So it was really a very complicated situation right there. The actress who played Olan, Louisa Reiner, actually got an Academy Award for uh, The Good Earth, for her work in this movie. And the film was also uh, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture. Now that went to The Life of Emil Sola, in which you can also see Paul Mooney. So you can probably say that that was a very, very good year for this actor. One thing that I noticed about the movie that I thought was interesting and important was that the ending is slightly altered. Okay, in, in, in the novel, the climax of the novel is basically the ending of the film. That's the best way that I can put it. And the climax in the film it has to do with the locusts, and that is not really the part where it is located in the novel. So you could say maybe that they changed the structure a little bit. And perhaps more important than that, I feel that the character of Wang Lung is more likable in the film than he is in the novel, at least slightly. So those were some things that I wanted to mention about that. Now there's something very interesting here. I have a book titled My Several Worlds by Pearl Buck. This is one of her autobiographical books. It's very interesting. It turns out that Pearl Buck it was just a fascinating woman. Okay, she's a fascinating writer, but she was also fascinating in her life. And as you may expect, she talks quite a bit about the good earth in this book, which I highly recommend, by the way. She tells us, for example, that it took her only three months to publish or, or to write The Good Earth. I'm like, that, that is just amazing. Okay, three months. I can probably write like half a short story in three months. And she wrote an excellent novel in that time. But she also gives us a lot of ideas on the novel that I found to be enlightening and that I wanted to share with you uh, because of that. For example, she uh, shares the moment that she began to write the novel. And then she says, my story had long been clear in my mind. Indeed, it had shaped itself firmly and swiftly from the events of my life, and its energy was the anger I felt for the sake of the peasants and the common folk of China, whom I loved and admired, and still do. For the scene of my book, I chose the North Country, and for the rich southern city, Nanking. My material was therefore close at hand, and the people I knew as I knew 
myself. So it's something, the subject is something and the people, something that she is very close to. Then she shares some ideas on what the critics thought about her, especially when it comes to awards. So she says, even when the Pulitzer Prize had been awarded the Good Earth, certain critics had objected to so American an award being given to a book about Chinese peasants, written by a woman, and worse than that, a woman who had never lived in her own country. So that has to do with her quality as an outsider in US society, which if you ask me is actually something that makes her interesting, one of the many things that make her interesting as an author. And the last little bit that I wanted to share with you from this book has to do with the film adaptation and when she saw it. She says, I did not go to the opening, although I was in New York City at the time, for I dreaded the fanfare and publicity. I waited for a few days and then my husband and I went quietly to the theater and took seats in the gallery. It is an amazing experience to see the characters one has created come alive on the screen and I was much moved by the effort that had been made, especially by the incredibly perfect performance of Louise Reiner as Olan. She not only looked like a Chinese woman, but she moved like one, and every detail of action, even to the washing of a rice bowl, was correct. When I asked her how she had accomplished this, she told me that she had chosen from among the many Chinese employed on the set for the crowd scenes, a young woman whom she thought most like Olan. She had then followed this woman everywhere, watching her until she felt identified with her. When later the film was shown in China, as well as in other Asian countries, where incidentally it was a great success, Chinese friends wrote to me of their surprise and appreciation of Louise Reiner, marveling as I had at the miracle of her understanding. So maybe we should take that into consideration when we talk about the whitewashing, how Pearl Buck felt about this. And let me tell you, in this book she also says that when the novel was turned into a play, she hoped that the, the characters would be played by Chinese people. So she was very conscious of this even back in those days. She also tells us a very funny anecdote. Uh, apparently when she received the Nobel Prize, the press had announced that she had received it for the good earth. So she corrected them. She said, no, it was not for the good earth, but for the body of my work, right? So the press then corrected the mistake and said it was awarded for the body of her work. So apparently some people went to the bookstores asking for a book by Pearl Buck titled The Body of Her Work. I thought that was fantastic, you know, and she shares that in this book also. Final thing, okay, before we end. I forgot to show you the movie, so here it is. So this is the movie as I got it from the library. But it turns out that there is also a graphic novel. So The Good Earth was made into a graphic novel. This was published in 2017 and it was adapted by Nick Bertozzi, okay? So I would say this is very well done, okay? I, I really liked it. At first I was not too thrilled about the uh, background colors. It has a pink and light blue type of coloring. But as I continued to read it, I first, first of all, I didn't mind at one point, and then at one point I was like, this is actually quite pleasing to the eye, and it goes with the cover that you can see right here. So one thing about the adaptation is that it actually includes plenty of description. It includes plenty of the text from the novel. So it gives you a great visual experience, but at the same time, it doesn't let you forget the poetry of the writing by Pearl Buck. So it's really the best of both worlds that you get with this one. So if you get the chance to experience this in a graphic novel format, I would say it's a, it's a wonderful experience also. Bottom line, The Good Earth is worth your time. Okay, this is a novel that I believe that you should experience. It deserves to be read, and I'm even going to say it deserves to be reread, because as soon as I was finished reading it, I realized, oh wow, there are many scenes right here, many moments, many details that really could be examined more in depth and you don't get that from a first reading most of the time. Buck, by the way, continued the story of Wang Lung in two more novels so that The Good Earth became the first part of a trilogy. I personally don't feel like experiencing those novels. I think The Good Earth is powerful enough and I kind of want to keep it that way, you know? If I ever find myself with some extra time I would be curious to find out what happened to the sons, for example, of Wang Lung. Actually, the second novel in the trilogy is titled Sons, by the way. But 
as I said, you know, I think that The Good Earth is, is good enough for me at this point. I really enjoyed it. It's really a masterpiece. I think it deserves its status as a classic. So I highly recommend this novel, the movie, and the graphic novel adaptation if you're interested in the story in any of those forms. So do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? Just let me know. Those were my two cents on The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.